Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Neil Love from Research to Practice, and welcome to Year in Review. As today, we talk about what's going on over the past year in gynecologic oncology with Dr. Dana Chase from the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA in Los Angeles. As always, if you have any questions or cases you'd like to run by us, just type them in the chat room, and we'll talk about as many of these as we have time. As we always do in our webinars, there's a one-minute pre- and post-meeting survey in the chat room for you to take. If you take that, you'll get a lot more out of this experience. We know a lot of people end up listening to our webinars. If you're into audio content and podcasts, check out our Oncology Today series, including a program with Dr. Chase's former colleague, Dr. Monk, reviewing <laughs> ovarian cancer. We do uh, webinars all the time. Uh, Tuesday, July the 9th, we'll be doing one on multiple myeloma, talking about bispecifics, CAR-T, and everything else going on. We'll be coming back the next day on July 10th, talking about melanoma, non-melanoma, skin cancers, and so much going there, the big Nadine trial uh, that was presented at ASCO. And then on July 17th, we'll have a great program on ADCs and a triple negative breast cancer uh, that should be a great program, as well as our ALK program on non-small cell lung cancer on July the 18th. But today we're here to talk about gynecologic oncology, both from the point of view of the gynecologic oncologist as well as the medical oncologist. And as always, we will be talking about the use of non-approved agents and regimens. So check out the package insert for more information. So in the uh, chat room, you have our slides and we have a whole list of papers to talk about, but really, we want to really just update, get an update of what's going on in gynecologic oncology, and here's where we're heading. First, we're going to chat a little bit about what happened at ASCO, and some cool papers presented there, and then an update on ovarian cancer, and then including some new papers. Then we'll dive into HER2 as a therapeutic target of all gynecologic cancers and all solid tumors in general nowadays. Then we'll drop into endometrial cancer and, of course, get into the issue of IOs and how to use them. And we'll finish out talking about cervical cancer. But before we get started, I am just kind of curious. You know, we have a lot of people new to oncology or, that would, or you are or in our programs, uh, Dana. And you're an unusual case of somebody who started out in the community and then went, made their way back to, you know, an academic center. You were with Arizona Oncology with Dr. Monk for quite a few years, and now the last couple of years at UCLA. Just kind of curious, again, for people just getting into the field, you know, what's the what it was like in these two settings for you? Yeah, well, um, uh, great great to be here and uh, chat with you. I, um, I definitely have a unique uh, situation. Not many people go from kind of a community uh, private practice to a type of setting back to um, academic medicine. I mean, we all started in academic medicine, right? So we all pretty much um, know what it's like to be in it. But, uh, you know, community, private practice in a suburb of, of Phoenix, you know, lots of patients, lots of surgery, lots of chemotherapy. I was very fortunate to have clinical trials, very fortunate to uh, maintain a collaboration with some um, scientists with the University of Arizona when I was uh, in Phoenix. Um, but I, I missed um, some of the uh, ability to train uh, fellows, for example, fellows in gynecologic oncology and be in a uh, academic center in terms of access to grants and research collaborators. And also Los Angeles just happens to be my home. So it sort of um, brought together my ability to go home with the ability to be in a uh, an academic center where there's a lot of um, really exciting research and education going on. So yeah, we work with uh, people from UCLA all the time. You got Dr. Slaney there. She was in a, a program we had at uh, SGO and ASCO as well. And a lot of the medical oncologists you just stole Dr. Bardia from MGH and breast cancer, and you got Dennis Slayman already there. So I know it's a really exciting place. All right, let's get into the content. And of course, you know, ASCO is not necessarily the first place you think about gynecologic oncology, but you see some good papers there. And these are three I just wanted to ask you about. Uh, one, I've been curious about this in breast cancer because there was a study looking at neoadjuvant PARP. Uh, so they had a paper there, the NEO trial. There was another study looking at endometrial cancer and obesity. I was curious where you what you thought about that. And then in terms of IOs, particularly in uh, MSI diseases, interesting study uh, looking at this, uh, I guess, a new antibody for an anti-tidget combined with uh, 
pembrolizumab. So just uh, taking a quick look at that, uh, any thoughts about the NEO study? I mean, as you would guess, you know, it looks like they uh, had pretty good uh, waterfall plot and a response there. Actually, I think they saw the same thing with breast cancer. It was only like about 50 patients, but it kind of never took off that I know of in breast cancer. Any thoughts about this paper? Yeah. So we we did see uh, an approach like this uh, presented by Shannon Weston at um, MD Anderson a, a year or so ago, uh, also looking at PARP inhibitor therapy in kind of a neoadjuvant right. uh, setting. So this is neoadjuvant elaparib in a recurrent platinum sensitive setting. And important to note, to go on this trial, you had to be a surgical candidate because there was a secondary cytoreduction incorporated into the trial design. So if you had a patient that you didn't think you wanted to take for surgery, she, she or uh, that patient wouldn't be able to go on, on trial. And, um, you know, I think we're all really hoping someday, you know, we saw this with uh, checkpoint inhibitors in the uh, recurrent setting for our uh, endometrial patients. We're hoping that in ovary patients, we're able to de-escalate care, you know, remove our traditional cytotoxic chemotherapies and give them targeted therapy alone and hope to make the same kind of difference. Um, and so I think this this trial kind of said, well, maybe that's a possibility. It's hypothesis generating, you know, it has to be confirmed in a larger study. This, there were not a, a lot of patients on this trial. So definitely um, Olaparib um, or PARP inhibitors in general um, do um, help with ovarian cancer patients. The, the question is now that we're giving Olaparib frontline, uh, would this drug um, perform like this in the recurrent setting as a single agent? And that I don't know. So interesting, um, maybe not practice changing, but interesting to still uh, think about. Hope to read the, so, the um, publication. <laughs> yeah, it will be interesting. Yeah. So I've always been fascinated by the connection between obesity and endometrial cancer and diet and cancer to start with also has always been interesting. And there was a paper, again, presented uh, at the ASCA meeting about that. And I noticed in your CV, it was funny because I saw that you had done work in uh, microbiome, which I always love to see research in that. But interestingly, when we talked, I didn't realize this is vaginal microbiome. So anyhow, can yeah. you kind of maybe comment a little bit about the issue of obesity and endometrial cancer, this paper, and also this research looking at vaginal microbiome? Yeah, so I just want to also make a plug for the presenter of this abstract was a resident at UCLA that graduated last year. So she's now, now a fellow at uh, UC Irvine. Anyway, I think... Um, Definitely, we know obesity is associated with endometrial cancer. I mean, this is not um, something new. Uh, this we know for sure. And um, I think uh, the last bullet point here, uh, you know, though not scientifically causal, the relationship is very clear. But I will say, you know, um, at this point, there's a lot of obese uh, people in the United States, and the majority of obese uh, patients do not get endometrial cancer. Um, so we really have to try to figure out exactly why some obese patients are getting endometrial cancer, and could there be other factors like the vaginal microbiome, which which can also reflect what's going on in the endometrium? Uh, could that play a role? I mean, there's definitely scientists around the country at UCLA and Arizona and Ohio State that are looking at uh, in uh, on the East Coast as well that are looking at. Um, different uh, ways that potentially obese, obesity could lead to endometrial cancer, but it's not necessarily causal. It's, it's, um, it's associated, uh, which is definitely something, I think this is a plug to do more research, which uh, I'm happy about. So any, uh, anything else you want to say about uh, the work that was done, I guess you, when you were in uh, Arizona on the vaginal microbiome, how you did that research and whether you think it has any future? Yeah, I mean, it's still a, a work in progress. Uh, I give all the credit to the PhD, uh, Dr. Herbst Kralovitz that I worked with in, uh, in Arizona. Uh, we're still, um, piecing this together and trying to figure it out. But we, at the time of hysterectomy, we obviously consented the patient preoperatively. Before we prepped the patient for surgery, we collected a vaginal swab, a cervical vaginal lavage, and then also an endometrial culture collected that, proceeded with the hysterectomy, and then before pathology actually starts to process the specimen, we, we um, 
did another culture of the endometrium once it's out of the patient. And so, and then at the same time, we also collected a rect rectal swab. So we had several specimens that we could analyze to look at not just um, uh, microbiome, which can be di diverse and different in, in uh, various patients, but also uh, metabolites um, and other uh, biomarkers that are potentially in that cervical vaginal lavage. Um, and it's like I said, it's a work in progress, um, but hopefully uh, we're going to um, get further along in it. We collected specimens on benign disease, pre-invasive, as well as cancer. So we had a good amount of patients to compare to. So I'm going to have to practice uh, saying vibosilumab. Yeah. I'm not even <laughs> close at this point, but <laughs> maybe yeah. Vibo. i will come up with a nickname here. Yeah. But, you know, this paper really, to me, also just brings up the issue of the fact that not everybody with MSI high disease does well in a checkpoint inhibitor. And the question about why, if you add in, you know, anti-tigit or some of these other agents. Any mm -hmm. comments about this? I guess, you know, um, it's a small number of patients that had MSI high disease at 65% response rate, but maybe that was, as it seems, maybe a little higher than Pembro alone, but I guess just more an yeah. exploratory analysis. Seemed like they had mm -hmm. a fair amount of autoimmune toxicity. Any thoughts about this? Yeah, I mean, definitely, um, just to highlight that point, definitely more toxicity. I think it was 30 to 40% grade three or four toxicity when you added this anti-tigit agent. And you got to remember, this is in the recurrent setting. And so now we're giving uh, anti-PD-1 or anti pd one in the frontline setting. Um, you know, I will say it's definitely very important and very effective for a DMMR patient to get uh, checkpoint inhibitor therapy. It's not a slam dunk for everybody, meaning it's not a cure for everybody. So could some subset of patient in the frontline setting maybe benefit from the addition of this anti-tigit agent? You know, will you allow for the toxicity if you cure more patients? Um, that's to be told, but maybe that's where this is headed, uh, to try to cure more patients in the frontline setting. I just worry a little bit about the toxicity, which is already a little, honestly, in the real world, uh, already a little challenging sometimes with these uh, checkpoint inhibitors, but um, but but we'll see in, in, future tr in future trials. You think in terms of, it's interesting you brought that question up because I've asked this a number of times over the years, which is the, the auto, the toxicities, autoimmune toxicities, the way they play out. Anything different about it in gynecologic oncology patients? You immediately think about the abdomen, obviously. Do you see more problems with colitis or if they get colitis is a more problem? Does radiation add to it? Any broad comments about the types of toxicity you see? Um, you know, I haven't, I mean, <laughs> I haven't seen necessarily a different toxicity profile than, um, than other, uh, cancer types. I think, um, when you look at the, the trials, like, for example, GY018 or the Ruby trial, you get pretty reassured that there's very minimal grade three or four toxicity with these checkpoint inhibitors. But then in the real world, um, you know, if you're not careful, yeah, you're going to run into a colitis or a pneumonitis or a nephritis or a dermatitis, or uh, definitely we see a lot of thyroiditis potentially that, um, that, um, that maybe we just weren't used to seeing uh, previously. But, um, but uh, I, just because you asked, I, one time I did see a patient who had a pretty bad case of what's called lichen sclerosis when she was on a checkpoint inhibitor therapy. It might not be related, but there is some thought that lichen sclerosis, which is a condition of the labia, uh, that's very uncomfortable for women, women it could have an autoimmune cause. And so could that lichen sclerosis have been associated with her checkpoint inhibitor therapy? Not much in the literature about it, but I was curious because she developed it on, uh, on treatment. Um, but just something to think about, not, not necessarily, not necessarily related. Does it go away with steroids? It does go away, doesn't go away necessarily, but some of the symptoms are ameliorated by uh, steroid cream for sure. All right, let's get into uh, the nitty gritty here of some of the papers related to specific issues. But first, let's go from the chat room, a quick case for you from Uzoma, 75-year-old woman, stage 3 serous ovarian cancer, somatic BRCA2 mutation, decline PARP inhibitor maintenance in the front line. Now it's two years later, she's got platinum sensor recurrence, 
would you use a PARP inhibitor? And which one? I'll add. Yeah, so I think I heard BRCA mutated, didn't want a uh, PARP inhibitor in the front line. She's, I'm assuming she's getting par, uh, platinum-based treatment again, and she's responding to her platinum-based chemotherapy again. Um, as long as she has a response, I think it's appropriate in a BRCA mutated patient to use it second-line maintenance. Yes, I would do that. Well, while we're talking about it, and we'll get into this later, but as long as this case really brings it up, what are the situations where you will use a, uh, a PARP inhibitor in the recurrent disease setting? In this case, when the patient hasn't had a PARP inhibitor, has a BRCA mutation, I think that clearly is one thing. Any other scenarios? Yeah, I mean, I honestly am using um, PARP inhibitor therapy so commonly in my homologous recombination deficient and my BRCA mutated somatic or germline patients frontline that um, pretty rare for me to give it again to them in recurrence. Um, but I will consider it like, for example, in a patient that it, you know, she was on PARP inhibitor maintenance. She completed her two or three year course. She's been disease free for a year. You know, I have done that in clinical practice. I have retreated with PARP inhibitor maintenance after they got second line platinum based chemo. Um, so that would be a patient that I would consider using it again in. Um, if they progressed on PARP inhibitor treatment um, or had very bad toxicity with it, um, I might not uh, might not use it again, even if the patient's BRCA mutated. So a really good follow-up question from Azuma says, how long would you use it in this patient metastatic disease? Yeah. Yeah, so I mean in the frontline setting we we do 2 years uh with one PARP inhibitor with olaparib and 3 years with niraparib. You know, in a recurrent setting not sure you're going to get that 2 or 3 years disease-free uh chemo-free interval again, but it's possible. So I would just go to 2 or 3 years and kind of see how how it's going. Uh Initially, I thought nobody was going to want to come off PARP inhibitors, but in, in my kind of real world practice, some of them are pretty thankful to come off due to, due to toxicities like low grade fatigue or low grade uh, GI toxicity. Some are like, yes, I'm going to come off. I'm ready to stop after two or three years. But, um, but in the recurrent setting, technically you're able to go until progression or toxicity. Yeah, well, I hear you, though, that if you get to two or three years, you'd be happy. But, of course, the other thing is people, a lot of people are keeping AML and MDS in their mind to get nervous with more, yes. longer duration. Although I'm not sure we know that for sure, but you know, it makes sense that you get nervous about yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, that's true for sure. Definitely should mention that, yeah. So we picked out a bunch of papers. Honestly, I'm not even sure how important some of these are, but I think it leads into topics that I know people ask a lot of questions about. So one is the issue of bevacizumab, when to use it and for how long. There was this paper in the JCO this year, the BOOST study, phase three study, looking at the optimal duration of Bev. But really what I want to ask you about and what oncologists ask me about is first line is first of all, when you have an upfront situation, when do you use Bev? Do you use it uh, neoadjuvantly and adjuvantly? Would you ever use it adjuvantly if they hadn't had it neoadjuvantly, but they had neoadjuvant chemo? And then do you, what's the Kellum score and do you use that in trying to decide about Bev? Yeah, so um, now you go around the country and you hear mixed uh, views on this. So I'll just tell you, for me, neoadjuvant patient, I use Bevacizumab. So preoperatively hold the dose uh, in your chemo pre-surgery, do your surgery, hold the dose post-surgery, and then keep giving BEV in your follow-up uh, adjuvant cycles, and then BEV and maintenance. So I do not use BEV and maintenance if I haven't used it in the, um, with, the, with the chemotherapy. I mean, we had uh, GOG-218, I think, that in, informed us uh, maybe not to do that. So definitely, if I use BEV with chemo, neoadjuvant or adjuvant, I'll, I'll use it in maintenance. Um, and, you know, we used to treat with BEV kind of forever, but uh, with this study and also with the Paula uh, one study, um, you know, I, I'm pretty comfortable now giving it for like 15 months, uh, including the months that the patient um, got it uh, with chemotherapy. So it's nice to be able to stop it and it's nice to have data to, to allow us to stop it. 
um, the the um, algorithm study that that you're um, uh, mentioning, the Kellum study or the Kellum algorithm, you can actually go on a website, type in the patient's CA125, and it'll calculate kind of um, her, you know, the prediction of whether or not she's responding to her platinum or not based on the CA125. I find it interesting, but I'm not using it in clinical practice. And um, um, it really hasn't, they haven't studied it as a way to allocate, allocate treatment. It's more like an interesting fact that maybe you can use to talk to the patient, but I don't know if I would necessarily use it to stop treatment and switch an agent without a study, like a prospective study that tells me to do that. Um, I hesitate a little bit, although I encourage you to go online, try it out and kind of see how it applies to some of your patients, but I, I haven't been using it to, to uh, change treatment allocation. And it looks like, uh, you know, adding a longer duration of BEV doesn't seem to help, at least in terms of this particular study. So, yep. again, we saw a lot of papers coming out this past year, but most of them, other than the duo studies that I want to ask you about, so the classic upfront studies, you know, there were several um, um, presentations in terms of, you know, longer follow-up, et cetera. But here are the questions that, you know, we hear from oncologists and gynecologic oncologists all the time. And the first is, you know, it kind of after these last few years of sort of going back and forth about trying to, you know, break people out, it kind of seems like we've rolled into a situation where people are either HR deficient, they've got BRCA, they got a high LOH score, or one of the, you know, PAL B2. You can tell us what you, uh, you know, consider. And then they're, I guess to me, like the wild type patients. But yeah. to me, they've, and the real advance has come in the people with HR deficient tumors. And, I guess the first question is, uh, how do you approach, you know, the, the issue about whether to use a PARP inhibitor in a patient uh, in the first line uh, primary maintenance situation? And then how do you decide which one and for how long? Yeah, so I, in the last year, you know, we've gotten some updated presentations and publications about long-term follow-up which um, for both the um, uh, SOLA1 trial, which is a laparib in BRCA mutated patients, the PAOLA1 trial, which is a laparib with BEV, bevacizumab in HRD or, and or uh, BRCA mutated, and uh, then the PRIMA trial, which is um, niraparib maintenance. Um, so, you know, we've gotten some, at least for the first two uh, um uh, studies that I mentioned, we've gotten some updated um, follow-up information. So in this study, for example, the PRIMA study, we've gotten progression-free survival and safety at three and a half years using niraparib in patients platinum, have a response to platinum. Um, and this uh, is an interesting uh, um, and potentially very, very meaningful drug in a BRCA mutated or an HRD patient. I personally don't use it in my HR proficient or HRD negative or LOH negative, however you're going to say it, patient. For me, that patient goes on BEV and I don't use a PARP inhibitor. Um, but in a BRCA mutated HRD patient where you're not using BEV, Niraparib uh, definitely has long-term follow-up data in an HRD patient, uh, BRCA mutated or not, uh, with 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 some um, definitely separation in the curve. There, <laughs> it doesn't do the usual banana effect. It's it stays uh, separated. And then uh, in terms of Solo One, which was a laparib maintenance in a BRCA mutated patient, we have seven-year follow-up data. Again, very meaningful, I think, for our BRCA mutated patients. Um, so I'll use um, um, PARP inhibitor, Olaparib, or Niraparib uh, in all my BRCA mutated patients. Um, if I use BEV with chemo, I'll use the Paola 1, which is Olaparib with BEV. If I don't use BEV with chemo, I'll consider Niraparib or Olaparib uh, after I talk to the patient about the kind of benefits of each. In the HRD patient, if you were going to use niraparib, would you use it for three years? Yeah, I mean, I would. I think I, I pretty, I'm, I'm pretty um, strict in terms of following what the studies do because I, I feel as though if you use the regimen that the study used, if you look at the eligibility criteria, you use the same regimen, you use the same biomarker testing, 
maybe, hopefully you get the same results, right? So I, um, I'm pr- pretty strict about that. Uh, of course, if the patient's having toxicity and she can't tolerate the three years, I'll pull her off. If she's really, really set on staying on at post three years, I'll, you know, bend the rules and allow her to stay on. So, you know, before three years or after three years, it's like a shared decision making with the, the patient as long as she's tolerating it. I noticed you took a deep sigh before you answered that question, which to me means you probably don't use your wrapper too much. <laughs> Anyhow, let's ask you about this other question. And speaking to Shannon West, and you know, uh, the issue here, a couple issues. So in, in ovarian cancer is the question of whether, you know, anti-PD-1 antibodies has an effect. We're going to talk about endometrial cancer, about whether HARP inhibitors have an effect. But what about this, you know, these the issue here? of IO and specifically this uh, Dervalumab study, the uh, duo and got. Yeah, I, let me just make one comment about a specific patient that comes to mind. She's a, a 3A ovary cancer, so advanced ovary cancer, but had complete resection. Um, she is HRD. I didn't use BEV with platinum-based chemo, and she is on niraparib. <laughs> <laughs> she's on niraparib 200 milligrams a day, um, tolerating it pretty well. So in a complete resection, HRD patient not using BEV, um, she liked the once a day dosing and um, um, it's been it's been good for her. But anyway, just a little bit of an aside patient patient story there. But um, in yeah. terms of duo, oh, sorry, were, were you going to say something? No, go ahead. Okay. In terms of uh, duo O, interesting. I, I'm not sure really who to use this in. Meaning, okay, let's say I'm already using Bev and Elaparib, like the Palawan regimen, in an HRD patient. Do I add Derva? Do I add um, a checkpoint inhibitor therapy to my already? Alaparib and bevacizumab um, combination. Now, the problem with the study is there isn't a PALA-1 arm, so there isn't an Alaparib-Bev arm. Um, so that makes it a little hard for me to interpret. Um, it's not on this slide, but but in my HR proficient patient, where I'm not going to be using um, a PARP inhibitor in in combination with Bev uh, because they're not they're not uh, your Paolo one patient. In that patient, does should I use Derva with with a PARP inhibitor to make her PARP inhibitor work better? I don't know. I don't know. That wasn't the primary endpoint of the study, and I question whether or not I want to introduce that toxicity. Um, so it's still kind of a, I think, an unknown for that patient population. Currently, I, I really uh, won't add Derva to my PARP inhibitor, to my Paolo one regimen at to this to this day. I wonder if anybody else will, but um, maybe somebody will speak up and say they're doing it <laughs> and share. Yeah, I think I, I think people maybe or most people I've heard you know react pretty much the way you did. Here's another paper from ASCO. I think people know I'm a big fan of cool uh, trial names. I like the idea of Capri as a trial name. But anyhow, I'm not too familiar with uh, ATR inhibitors, but I guess they combined it uh, with Olaparib. Um, anything you want to say about you know these uh, ATR inhibitors and whether they have any kind of future with ovarian cancer? Yeah, I mean, I think... Um Definitely, hopefully, in certain BRCA mutated patients, we're curing them with single agent PARP inhibitor maintenance, right? But it's like, like I said, in other uh, situations, it's not a slam dunk for everybody. And so the question is, if you target two different DNA repair pathways, are you going to have more enough of an effect of the PARP inhibitor? And so I'm hoping maybe we see more of this uh, in in phase three clinical trials in certain clinical situations. Um, definitely looks like it could have an added effect to the the PARP inhibitor and and kind of mechanism of action sort of makes makes sense. The synergy makes sense. So let's talk a little bit about HER2 and gynecologic cancers in general. Of course, we have the Pan tumor approval of TDXD that just uh, occurred in patients who have IHC3+. Plus. So I think everybody outside of breast cancer is going to be seriously looking at that. And we're talking to these people all the time, including gynecologic oncologists. And 
this agent is potentially, you know, a consideration in all three of the cancers we're talking about today. Before we get into kind of specific issues, any sort of general thoughts? I mean, you're at the place where Dennis Slayman is, who started this whole thing. But uh, any general comments about how HER2 is going to fit into the, the uh, gynecologic cancer scene? Yeah, I mean, um, I will tell you at our tumor boards, this is coming up a lot. Like the trainee presents the patient and like the next question out of the mouth of the attending panel is what's her HER2 status? So it's in every, in, in every line of therapy even. So um in every uh, disease site, also we're asking what's her HER2 status, just based on IHC, which is nice. We don't necessarily have to go to to fish. So, um, um, I I'm really excited about this in the three plus patient. I mean, the question is how soon to use it. You know, like is she, let's say for example she's an endometrial patient, she got her frontline treatment with or without checkpoint inhibitor therapy, and she progresses. I don't know a year or so later. Um, is the next line of therapy TDXD alone, single agent TDXD? Um, you know, in a three plus patient, maybe. I mean, I, it would be hard to beat that, um, that response rate in a, in a clinical trial. Um, so that, that, um, that could be a good patient to use TDXD next. And we're very eager to do it. I think it's in the, the one plus two plus that, um, Maybe it's a little bit more of an unknown. Maybe don't use it quite as soon, uh, you know, in, in uh, lower lines of therapy, uh, but definitely keep it on your plate for recurrence, uh, maybe second, third, fourth line. Um, you know, I, at UCLA, at UCLA, we're seeing so many patients with multiple lines of therapy. I think I saw, uh, last week or two weeks ago in clinic, a patient with good performance status, seven lines of therapy, and she wants more treatment and she's doing well. She's walking two miles a day. She's, you know, ready to go on her next agent. So, um, you know, to have more drugs that patients have available to them, even if they're one plus or two plus, um, is great for patients like her that are in their seventh line. They're not eligible for clinical trial and they have the biomarker and they have a good performance status. So definitely, um, exciting, um, exciting world with this, this new medication. <laughs> I was actually just flashing on the fact that tomorrow I have scheduled to do a 90-minute recording, and the topic is her too, and the person I'm mm -hmm. uh, doing the video with is a pathologist. So we're going to spend oh, perfect, 90 yeah. minutes talking about the pathology of her too, which gives you yeah. a little bit of an insight. I looked at the slide deck, you know, it's like unbelievable amount of content to go through, but it also comes down to, you know, practical issues, as you said, Right now, you have this uh, uh, indication for IHC three plus. You know, in breast cancer, we have her too low. You know, which I don't think there's mm -hmm. much data outside of breast cancer. But you were alluding to that. You also, as you alluded to, can have patients with IHC one or two plus who are fish positive. I don't know mm -hmm. how that's going to play out with ovarian cancer or the gynecologic can cancers. But in breast yeah. cancer, they would call that her two positive. But, you know, the excitement yeah. about this, and certainly oncologists are excited about it because they've treated breast cancer, but there's a, also a big caveat, which is the tolerability issues. And mm -hmm. I wonder, you know, we talked to all the other disciplines, GI, lung, et cetera, and they really are not uh, exactly tuned in at this point. But I'm just kind of curious what you're hearing, what, what uh, you're talking about at your institution about two things. One is even though it's an antibody drug conjugate, it has been associated with acute, quote, chemo-like toxicity, nausea, vomiting, et cetera, you know, pretty aggressive antiemetic prophylactics, for example. Any thoughts about that? Have you yourself used TDXD? Because I find a lot of people have not. Yeah, I mean, I um, personally have not used it in a patient as of yet. Uh, we We share patients a lot of times, so we'll cross cover and have patients in the hospital or in the ER or in clinic kind of come see us that are on um, uh, this therapy. Um, but uh, I, you know, it's funny because you, you go, you go to training, you go to, uh, to be a G1 oncologist, you're an OBGYN first, and then you're a G1 oncologist. And so you, 
you have comfort with certain chemo regimens and, you know, with some of these antibody drug conjugates, well, I, I will say with, with bevacizumab, we got comfortable with hypertension. With some of these uh, antibody drug conjugates, um, we're now getting comfortable with ocular care. And now we're having to get comfortable with pneumonitis. <laughs> so I think... Um, you know, if you're not already uh, familiar with kind of the pneumonitis uh, triage for um, this therapy, uh, definitely, I think it's in the slide deck. Um, you could probably reference it or, or pull it up. Definitely get get comfortable with the pneumonitis triage because um, it's not something you want to miss. And it's one of those toxicities that you want to hold therapy for a grade one. So, uh, you know, typically we don't hold therapy for a grade one. You know, you wouldn't necessarily do that for neuropathy or GI or even ocular toxicity. But for a pneumonitis grade one, you hold. And for a pneumonitis grade two, you stop. So um, this is this is more aggressive than some of our other toxicities, um, definitely. Uh, which again, now gynecologic oncology, uh, we have we're we're having to get familiar with pneumonitis uh, on top of all the other things that are are new in our world. Uh, but uh, hopefully, if you're comfortable with it and do the appropriate triage, the ho appropriate holding of therapy when you need to, you can keep patient uh, patients on treatment. So here's the uh, FDA approval just on uh, April 5th that uh, came out. Uh, again, IHC 3 plus, we'll see where that heads. Uh, here's some of the data looking at TDXD in the basket trial. There was biliary patients in there, et cetera. But in terms of gynecologic uh, patients, and you can see on the, they have uh, IHC 3 plus there in the middle is the highest uh, rate. But you see uh, with, uh, with uh, ovarian cancer, you know, response rate of 60%, cervical cancer, 75%. Uh, where am I? Oh, endometrial cancer, again, is that uh, 84? Yeah, yeah 84%. So yeah. really high. And, of course, the thing about uh, the thing about TDXD, uh, we know from breast cancer, is these responses are often for a very long period of time. So mm -hmm. really a great drug to have as an opportunity. But I think you point out, the big caveat there in terms of pneumonitis. And it's interesting that that algorithm, a lot of the, again, outside of breasts, I, I don't hear people verbalizing that algorithm that you just verbalized, which we know from breasts, which is mm -hmm. like you said, you're trying to, if they're going to get pneumonitis, you want to pick it up before they're asymptomatic, grade one, stop the drug, give steroids, hopefully they re, you know, re, re, uh, respond, and maybe you even restart again, which we've heard a lot of cases like that. So that's yeah. the objective, I guess. Uh, I guess the one thing we've been th we've been even when we were at the Oncology Nursing Society meeting, you know, the idea that when you see a patient who has a solid tumor nowadays, who's run out of treatment options and still has a good performance status, and there are a lot of people like that, that you need to get make sure they have an I at least an IEC at a minimum. I mean, yeah. a lot of people are going to you know they they get a. Uh, you know, NGS on these patients, but that's not going to give you the, the, the protein overexpression. You may see, you know, uh, amplification, which would be a clue for you to look at it. Is that kind of the way you're sort of thinking through it? Yeah. So um, the nice thing is you can do this in-house um, pretty much across the country. You can get HER2 IHC staining. Um, what you're, you'll hear people talk about, and what I'm interested to hear about in your discussion with the pathologists, um, is the difference between gastric criteria versus breast. And so um, we're supposed to be using gastric criteria for this indication, uh, but if you're not careful, um, probably I would guess mostly your pathologists are doing the breast, um, uh, the breast scoring. So, um, um, that would be something to be careful about, but I'm cur I'm going to be curious to hear what the pathologist says. <laughs> um, yeah, about me too. That. Uh, yeah, I want to find out whether there's anything as her two zero. I feel like ultra low, you know, like anything mm -hmm. right now at this point in breast, they'll use to treat. But you know, I yeah. guess all the other cancers are going, to, are going to be a few years behind breast. All right, let's talk about endometrial cancer. A lot happened over the past year, particularly related to IOs. So a, big, a couple of big uh, randomized studies uh, coming out, but there's still a bunch of questions. I mean, when you think about metastatic endometrial cancer, particularly first line therapy, first of all, we're going to break them down into MSI high or MSI stable. So just kind of curious in general right now, what your approach is first line therapy 
MSI high disease, uh, you know, in, you know, outside of gynecologic cancers, colon cancer, they use IO alone, but you guys studied IO plus chemo. So what are you using nowadays for first line therapy, MSI high? Yeah. So, um, if you have an advanced stage endometrial cancer patient, there's going to be a couple different factors that might alter your, your kind of prescription in, in first line treatment. One is definitely DMMR or PMMR. So proficient or deficient in MMR is definitely going to drive some decisions, but then also measurable, non-measurable. So patient has measurable disease, patient might not have measurable disease, but had bulky lymph nodes, or there's the patient that just had a, a 3C1 based on a microscopic uh, uh, area in one of her lymph nodes. So um, in for me, uh, definitely in my measurable stage 3C or 4 first line DMMR patient, I'm using either Pembro or Dostarlamab with uh, platinum-based chemo in the, in the first line and in, in front line. Um, it's the PMMR patient that I'm not necessarily giving it to everybody. I think definitely if there, we saw some data at the meetings this year looking at uh, P53 mutated uh, patients that are PMMR. So PMMR, P53 mutated uh, metastatic endometrial cancer. That patient, I probably will personally use a checkpoint inhibitor in. Uh, it's the P53 wild type patient that I might not use it in based on the, the Ciendo trial and some updated data that you, you have in this slide deck on that. So um, just kind of to summarize, DMMR, advanced metastatic, checkpoint inhibitor therapy with platinum-based chemotherapy in almost everybody, um, and then PMMR, Picking and choosing a little bit, um, you know, uh, probably uh, will be interesting to see. Um, we had a press re release uh, looking at low, lower risk endometrial cancer patients getting uh, checkpoint Pembro with with chemo first line. Um, should be interested, interesting to see that actually presented and published. But in my lower risk, you know, stage three C one microscopic to the node, PMMR, might not use checkpoint inhibitor therapy in that patient. It's kind of got to be a shared uh, shared decision with the patient as long as she kind of understands the potential risk benefits. So Hassan in the chat room wants to know what about using uh, Pembrolenvatinib after CPI first line and MSI high? Yes. Um, well, <laughs> Uh, I'm assuming uh, that um, participant means like using that in maintenance after you've given checkpoint with chemo. Is that what they mean? No, I uh, assume it. I assume it means second line if they progress. Oh, well, let's okay. say they progress. Yeah, they progress on chemo IO, for example. Yeah, um, you know, I think I've I've heard. I haven't done it myself yet. Uh, like for example, patients progressing on Pembro. I've heard people add linvatinib to Pembro to try to get more response. I think that's reasonable. Um, let's say she progresses post-PEMBRO. Um, I've heard some people say they want to give platinum again with IO again, and I've heard other people say they're going to use uh, linvatinib PEMBRO um, if they progress, even if they progress progressed uh, after the, the, the PEMBRO was completed. So, reasonable. We don't have necessarily data to tell us what to do in this situation. So, I don't know. It's it's kind of going to be up to you um, and and kind of the clinical situation. So actually, I just see a great case. I'm just sort of kidding. I see a great case actually that you told me about before we came yeah. on that I want you to tell the audience about, but it relates to this question we have here, which is how often do you see BRCA or other HRD pathway abnormalities in patients with endometrial cancer? And can those patients, and we hear a lot of questions about that, benefit from yeah. PARP inhibitors, and then we have the DOE and the RUBY part two that really looked into this. So first of all, can you tell us about this patient that you were telling me about? Yeah, so I recently got a patient as a, as a second opinion who uh, is DMMR 3C based on lymph nodes, non-measurable. <laughs> so meaning she doesn't have disease present on imaging after her surgery, but she had multiple lymph nodes positive. It wasn't just one little site in one node, she had multiple on each side. So DMMR, um, 
non-measurable on post-op CT. She was started, she already got cycle one of platinum-based chemo with distarlamab. And um, the, the, the question was, she came to me for second cycle and she wanted to know if I was going to add a PARP inhibitor to her IO maintenance because her Keras profile said she had a BRCA mutation, a somatic BRCA mutation. Um, so now that's, um, you know, Duo E uh, gives us some of that data. Uh, Honestly, in the, the DMMR patient, um, I'm not sure of the added benefit of a laparib to the uh, dravalumab. Um, you know, it's, it's an interesting question. I think with her, I, I definitely have to talk about toxicity. Definitely increases toxicity when you add the PARP inhibitor to DERVA or checkpoint inhibitor maintenance. Um, you know, she potentially would be the patient that you would want to use it on, although there was an abstract at ASCO saying BRCA mutated, not BRCA mutated on this study. They looked like they responded similarly. So maybe doesn't necessarily BRCA, maybe especially somatic BRCA, which shouldn't necessarily be used as a biomarker to choose to use um, uh, PARP inhibitor therapy. Um, but Nonetheless, I uh, have to have the conversation with her and, and talk to her about the risk benefits. So a few other uh, questions uh, related to the, this issue of uh, IOs and immunotherapy. I don't know if you've ever seen a patient with pole E, but uh, in a sort of hyper-mutated state, I mean, like in some situations they don't even treat it, but any comments? Yeah, I have yet to get one in my practice. <laughs> I'm waiting for the day that I actually have a poly mutated patient. Um, so, um, yes, but yes, you hear people talk about poly. Um, maybe you can de escalate therapy, maybe not as important to be as aggressive. Um, hopefully, in follow up studies, we'll get more information about this very small subset of patients. Um, I am waiting to see my first poly mutated, ultra mutated patient. So what do you do if you do have one? Do you treat them or not? Yeah, I mean, like, like I said, I, I, um, I think you can potentially de-escalate. Like that patient, for example, might not need checkpoint inhibitor. Will I be brave enough to not give her platinum taxane for a stage three or four disease? I don't know if I'm brave enough yet. Um, I hear some of my partners talk about it, but I don't hear people necessarily doing it yet. But I think in that in that subgroup, it was small a number of patients, maybe like five patients on the the Ruby or GY018 study. Um, didn't look like there was a benefit to um, to checkpoint inhibitor therapy, meaning they all did really well. Uh, but it was such a small number of patients. I just don't know if I feel comfortable making a clinical decision based in, based on a small subgroup analysis, very small subgroup analysis. Well, here's a case maybe encouraging you about your patient. 40, this is from Hassan, 48-year-old woman, uterine cancer, liver mets, progression post-chemo, BEV, BRCA mutated, second line of Laprib, now in CR for two years plus, exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point. Yeah, interesting. Sounds, sounds cool. Yeah, <laughs> very cool. So, uh, I wanted to ask you also, because this sort of jumped out at me at the uh, SGO meeting. I was like, hmm, where did this come from? You mentioned P53, and I know it's kind of like a little bit early, you know, in terms of clinical practice, but maybe it actually, you know, gonna, you mentioned the fact that uh, when you have MS stable, P53 mutated, they have really great responses, right? But then mm -hmm. the, on the wild type, what they saw was, you know, and now benefit from Selenexer. So yeah. maybe, you know, maybe we're going to be moving in the future towards an algorithm driven by P53. Anyhow, any thoughts about Selenex or, you know, it's approved in lymphoma and myeloma and not that easy a drug to use, but it looks kind of encouraging here. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, uh, we got some signals uh, in this P53 wild type group that uh, really were very remarkable, like ga game changing. Um, so we're currently enrolling to a trial um, to look at the addition of Selenexor maintenance to a P53 wild type um, patient population. Uh, and um, 
hoping um, that patients enroll on this trial uh, and hoping we get the results soon because I really would love to know that it's for sure a game changer. Um, you know, it's not it's not available commercially, right? It's not like um, a TDXD, which is you could you can get uh, for your one plus two plus or three plus. It's just not not available um, to give off study. So um, we really need to enroll on this study and get the results uh, to to maybe make this uh, a reality for our patients. But yes, adding Selenexor to the P53 wild type patient population and maintenance, the the res- the subgroup analysis results look amazing. And um, um, I will mention that on the on the uh, most recent endometrial trials, the GY018 and the uh, Ruby trial, it's the P53 wild type patients that don't look in the P53. I'm sorry, in the PMMR patient population, that's P53 wild type, it looks like they just don't l- get the same benefit from the checkpoint inhibitor. So really, really like excited to enroll patients on this trial using Selenexor and maintenance. And yes, there is GI toxicity. And yes, you have to be prepared for it and have to uh, be prepared to intervene and have um, uh, um, a supportive care for your patient to to make sure that they can tolerate it. Well, they're giving 60 milligrams Q week, so that'll be helpful. But, I mean, the drug is approved. So, I mean, theoretically, you could try to get it, I guess. But I think it's probably Maybe. too early. But, yeah, but, yeah I'm really curious how they're going to build in the, uh, you know, uh, tolerability uh, uh, considerations for this drug. Because I heard a lot of stories about it. It took a while for oncologists to get used to it in myeloma. So, it looks like, I know mm-hmm. one thing, it looks like they went to Q week. So, that should be helpful. But. I also wonder how it's going to go down in this trial, but we'll see. Yeah, we'll see. So cervical cancer. One thing I was really curious about, because of course we followed in uh, non-small cell lung cancer the story of the Pacific trial, patients with locally advanced non-resectable disease who got a great benefit out of post-chemo uh, radiation IO was their Valium now it's standard of care. And I've been looking for other trials using that kind of strategy, and then this popped up in cervical cancer. Just makes so sense, you so much sense. You wonder whether you get a little boost because of the radiation and chemotherapy. Maybe I don't know prepares the IO. I don't know. And now this is now approved in uh, cervical cancer. Uh, can you talk about how this is going to play out in the clinical practice? Yeah. So um, I mean, I think the um, the um, uh, the results were um, impressive. It 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 wasn't a um, like a slam dunk, but it's definitely improving survival. So I uh, I think um, um, you know using a checkpoint inhibitor with uh, chemo RT in a locally advanced patient um, should be standard of care. Meaning. Uh, the FDA approved it for stage three or four A. Um, in the subgroup analysis on the A18 A18 study, it was the stage three or four patient population that kind of looked like they benefited the most, and so the FDA chose to approve it for that subgroup. Uh, but the study was um, w- did include other stages uh, within the patient population. So for a stage three three or f- to four A. Um, Chemo RT with Pembro should be standard of care. Um, definitely um, looks like it uh, can improve um, outcomes for patients and cure more patients. Again, in this situation, we're trying to cure more patients. Uh, we want to improve the cure rate from you know fifty to sixty percent to seventy plus percent. You know, we want to cure more patients. Um, and in this stage three to four A patient population, that could be very meaningful. The question is, what are you going to do with your other lower risk, uh, locally advanced patients? Are you going to kind of bend the rules and also give them um, a Pembro with chemo RT, or are you going to do something else? Um, so that kind of will truth will be told in real wor- world studies uh, in the future whether or not people are doing that. So here's uh, the approval for this strategy that came out in uh, January. Here's the paper uh, from Lancet looking at it. Mm-hmm. And uh, as you said, here's the benefit. I mean, hazard rate for progression survival, 0.7. See that in a lot of trials, survival, 0.73. You know, it depends how you plot the, how the graphic looks, but hazard rate is hazard rate. And those kind of hazard rates end up things getting used. Curious also about, you know, we're talking about antibody drug conjugates all the time. 
And this is one of the earlier ones I started hearing about, to sodomavidotin in uh, cervical cancer. Interesting agent and interesting toxicity, too, in terms of ophthalmic issues. I think that was the first ADC I heard about that had eye issues. How's that actually played out? I know you, you don't see too much cervical cancer. And that's another question I have. Like, where are the cervical cancer patients, particularly those with advanced disease? Um, yeah. Are they located? Are they, yeah. Yeah, I mean, cervical cancer does not make it to the top 10 most common or top 10 most deadly cancers in, in women in the United States. But there's definitely certain pockets, unfortunately, in the United States that have a higher incidence and from cervix cancer. Um, it just so happens kind of in my certain area of Los Angeles, I don't see a lot of cervix cancer. Um, but in other areas of Los Angeles, there are more. I saw more cervix cancer in, in Arizona, for example. Um, but uh, when you see these patients, uh, it's heartbreaking. They're um, especially the, the um, metastatic advanced and the recurrent patients. I mean, they tend to be younger age. They tend to be um, kind of participating a lot in terms of working, having young children, uh, these patients uh, and other patients also break your heart. But these, uh, this disease is particularly uh, heartbreaking. And um, we really didn't have anything great to give them um, second line or third line, you know, post-systemic chemo. We didn't have anything really great to use, you know, less than a 10% response rate to to treating second line cervix cancer patient with traditional single agent chemotherapy. So having this uh, new antibody drug conjugate to zotamab vidotin to use in second line or third line uh, for these patients is an improvement to what we had previously available, uh, which, which is great for these, these patients. What do you see in terms of quality of response? You know, a lot of these ADCs seem to really, you know, lead to pretty significant responses. What about the sodomy? Yeah, so, um, you know, uh, complete response or partial response, a little under uh, 20%. But if you add stable disease onto that, you really bump up the response rate. So, uh, mean, meaning when you add stable disease into the mix, it's called disease control rate. So, for me, uh, a patient with a two-centimeter node, if you're able to keep her at, with just a two centimeter node for months and months and months, meaning she has stable disease, she's not responding or progressing, she's just got stable disease, to me that's very meaningful. And that's the type of patient where you can see them on tizotamab vidotin for cycles and cycles and cycles. Um, you know, uh, it, unfortunately, if the patient has bulky disease and she's symptomatic, she's going to want a response, right? She's not going to, she's not going to suffer through stable disease for months if she's having symptoms from that disease. So for that patient that's having symptomatic recurrence, you really want to have partial or complete response. And, um, and I've, I've had that. Uh, I've had long, long, uh, responses in, in some of these patients, which, um, which is great. What about the ophthalmic issues? That was the first time I heard about ice packs being used. It, it seems like it makes a lot of sense, but uh, what yeah. have you been doing? Yeah, so there's a very clear like eye care protocol for this drug, and you can reference it online. You can look at the drug company website. Um, these patients have to see an eye care provider before they start treatment, and they have to show up for their treatment having had seen an eye care provider because you want to establish a baseline and that there's no pre-existing ocular disease. And then they're supposed to see an eye care provider before each cycle for at least nine cycles. Um, they just capped it at nine recently. It used to be like every cycle, but for the first nine, they want to see an eye care provider. And then they have to have three eye drops, the corticosteroid, the vasoconstrictors, and the lubricating eye drops. Uh, and there's very specific recommendations about using those with the treatment and then after the treatment's completed. And then, yeah, you put the ice packs on the eyes during treatment, I guess, to help probably with some of that vasoconstrictor effect, maybe helps the drug not to get into the to the eyes. Um, but with appropriate eye care, um, you know, you can uh, limit grade three or four toxicity, which is obviously very important. I think patients get very, very nervous when they, they start to read about blurry vision or, you know, ocular toxicity. They get very nervous. But uh, with, with appropriate and adequate eye care uh, instructions, we can hopefully uh, avoid that in the majority of patients. So, Dana, thank you so much for joining us yeah. tonight. <laughs> uh, audience, thank you for joining us. Be safe. 
Stay well and have a great night. Thanks so Thank much, you. Dana. Thank you. Have, have a, a good, good night.